Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. It's a full house. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I'm joined by Lloyd Patrick Jepson, Alan Morrison, Brian Degden, and Jim Orr to preview the big game. Celtic are playing Aberdeen at Putaudry. Loads is happening. Alan, I'll come to you first. You were asking if I was enjoying the season so far. My answer to that was it's been unpredictable, hasn't it? So far, anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's going to come down to the management of change. Um, what struck me last weekend is that, you know, Celtic lined up with 10 players that played last season. Um, there was only Navrutsky, if I got that right, Navrutsky, that uh, was was a, a new guy. And yet it just shows you how delicate and precarious, you know, team play is and, and team shape, etc. That Celtic looked a little bit ragged, a little bit disjointed at times in that performance, uh, despite the fact that really very little had changed in the in the lineup, and in fact, you know, you could argue there's as many things that Rogers would agree on philosophically on football as as, as Postecoglou, and yet, just that level of change, small level of change, was enough to be slightly disruptive to to the the fluidity of Celtic's play. And then, of course, on the Sunday we saw at Rugby Park, uh, two sides that always changed to the teams, and and one team obviously seemed to cope with that quite well, and one team didn't. So I think the theme for the early weeks of the season. Is going to be how well uh, teams adapt to change, as Rogers puts his imprint on the side and asks slightly different things of players. We saw hints of that on Saturday, Kyogo being the most obvious example. Um, mm-hmm. You know, how will the players adapt? Which players will adapt? Which players are actually less mm-hmm. able to adapt to what was previously quite a rigid system? So I think, I think, I think it's the it's the um, as I say, it's the attitude and. Uh, reaction to change, I think, was the thing I'm looking at in, in the first few weeks of the season. Attitude. We're going to be talking about attitude because obviously the tagline today, why drop in Rio and Bernabe? Oh, done. Sends a clear <laughs> message to Roger Squad. And, and you know, I, I think that uh, the two examples, although very different in terms of the reasons behind them, certainly does show, Jim, that Brendan Rogers is putting his stamp on this side. It's going to be the Brendan way. Uh, Rio Hatate is down to form. Bernabe is down to discipline. Uh, but regardless of that, Brendan Rogers uh, will be a disciplinarian mm. when it comes to this type of thing, isn't he? Interesting game last week, as Alan said there. Disjointed was the word I was going to use. Uh, but Alan used it first. Damn. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was good to be back. I mean, I've said previously I've got zero interest in non competitive games, but half past 12 last Sunday, we're back on the, the emotional roller coaster for the next nine, ten months or so, where we'll all be over analysing and worrying about a bunch of guys with green and white hoops on. And because we're obsessive, I mean, everyone that's kind of tuned into us, you're all obsessive, there's all you people there. So uh, we're back on the roller coaster. Uh, funny game last week. First thing to mention, I thought it was Nick Walsh. You know, I think Celtic fans are, are, are quick to criticise referees. Some referees, I thought, had a great game. Uh, got the big decisions right uh, because uh, a different referee might have gave different decisions. Those two big ones last week. And uh, mm-hmm. sitting behind that goal when Joe Hart did that, you're thinking, oh, no, that's him getting sent off. And I've got a penalty kick and the season just started and let it play on. And we get the penalty kick. So on a different day, it might have been different. I mean, we've been... We've conceded softer penalties than that, and we've been denied more stone wall penalties than the one we got. You know, so that was that was good. We got a good referee last week, and I was encouraged by that. So long may that continue. Uh, yeah, it was a funny game. Uh, first fifty minutes, they were really good. Dead impressed by them. We get the goal, get the second goal. Goals change games. Games finished. Uh, David Turnbull got a lot of the kind of uh, plaudits. But I thought Matt O'Reilly, Kyogo were the kind of two standouts for me. I thought O'Reilly got beyond Kyogo, and Kyogo was dropping back. I think uh, the fourth goal showed that, with the wee flick for Kyogo. There's one in the first half, I think, when Kyogo played in David Turnbull. Uh, three points. I mean, it's just good to be back with the football. There's no real football where I kind of metaphorically kick every ball that's happening. So I was I was knackered after the game. And then, as Alan said, I watched the game at night time at Rugby Park, and I metaphorically kicked every ball as well. So I was shattered come Saturday night, but three points ahead, day one, pretty good. Jim played two games of football. Brian Degnan, um, we, we've obviously covered all the preseason games. I get what Jim Jim is saying there. I, I guess I looked at it slightly differently this time round because I was really keen to see some of these changes, you know, in earnest with regards to how Brennan Rogers was going to shape the side personnel wise, 
who was going to be getting picked in the start 11, etc. There's been some surprises along the way, uh, Rio Tati being one of the bigger ones. And we're going to specifically look at every area of the park. Um, but in relation to the performance, it took us until Friday for someone on Axom to praise the referee. I don't know what that says about the uh, contributors, but well done, Jim, or you praised them in any case. Um, moving into this weekend's game then, Brian, um, what do you think will change Lineup wise shape-wise, anything, will it will it change for Pataudry? It's hard to tell. I think um, Rogers. I think we, the, the, one of the biggest differences with Rogers and Ange is the fact that Rogers tends to adapt a bit more. So I think he, he, you can normally, for the most part, sort of understand who Ange would pick. But I think with Rogers, he's a bit more tactical in terms of who he picks. So he may see changes, um, or it could be the case is more of the same. It's really hard to to guess. Um, but just on the, the tagline, you know, I think it's really we were falling over ourselves to praise Ange for his attitude of if you're not happy, don't play, and that's ruthlessness. And it, it's very clear that Rogers has that as well. I think all top level managers have to have it, but mm -hmm. I think it's good to see a clear message. And as well as praising the ref, I'm delighted that, that Jim called it Matt O'Reilly because I saw people being sort of critical of O'Reilly or I'm not really, you know been too excited by him but as everyone knows I'm a huge fan of his but and I, and I still think he's got the biggest ceiling in terms of potential in, in the squad in terms of where he can go but I, I thought he was really good and I think he'll be a mainstay of the team sort of broadly speaking across especially in more difficult venues like Epitodry and stuff um, and I say just off the top of my head the only change you may see is maybe home coming in because again I think what he'll give is that sort of stability and that calmness in midfield. So we're in a more difficult environment. I think he'll fit quite well into that. So you may see him, but I'd be pretty... One of the most exciting things about Rodgers is you're never... You, until an hour before kickoff, you're never 100% sure if the shape's going to change, if the lineup's going to change. And, and mm. I think that's, that's, that's really refreshing. It's a, it's a fair point about Matt O'Reilly. I, I want to focus on who we think is going to play at the weekend and why. But there are others that we will, we will uh, speak about specifically. The two that are on the tagline and the departed Carol Starfield, what that means for others in the squad. Um, I'll come to yourself, Lloyd. You've been off for a couple of weeks, so you've got plenty of opportunity to let us know your thoughts to the, the real start of the season. What did you make of it? I mean, I, I tend to agree with Alan in that you know it wasn't perfect. Jim says we looked a bit ragged. I felt, I felt the same, even though... You know, the personnel were largely the same as they were last season. I did feel as though it was a wee bit stop-start. Um, but that's to be expected, isn't it? I mean, you know, Rogers is trying to implement new ideas to the to this side. Um, I don't think there's going to be massive change instantly. But, you know, over the piece, it will happen. And we'll start to see the identity of Rogers' side slowly but surely. Yeah, you could kind of see that a bit on the way we started on Saturday as well. Because Ross County kind of just came out the traps right away. So... It's going to take time for the players to just adapt to Brendan and Brendan also adapt to these players. Um, but Saturday, got to agree with everybody else. I thought it was a bit ragged at certain points in the game. But once again, took all of the goal well, including the penalty. Turnbull obviously had a good game. O'Reilly had a good game. There was a few standouts. Obviously, Keogh goes well, which I think we didn't really expect him to drop back quite as much and have... Like a game in that kind of position, which does show that another side to his game as well. Yeah, it does. Now, we've got loads of comments coming in, um, uh, but before we go to them, I want to speak about Carl Starfelt, the dearly departed. He has flown the nest um, to be closer to his girlfriend, Jacinta, who we know about because obviously she played for Celtic. She's now played for Sport and Lisbon. He got his big move to Celta Vigo, undisclosed fee island. Are we hearing about five million quid for Starfelt? Is that what we're hearing for a transfer fee? Yeah, it sounds uh, just perhaps a tiny bit more than what I think we paid from originally. So um, I think the club have been, well, as far as I can gather, very sort of supportive and understanding of you know, his 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 own wishes. He's, again, we sometimes forget these players are human beings as well, and if it's for personal reasons, he wants to move on, and, and he's ended up getting a, a move to to the you know, Spanish uh, top division. So and Celta Vigo are, are a good club. So, you know, I think it's it's, it's, it's a kind of a win-win a, a in some in some senses. I think the club have done right by him. Uh, Celtic have lost an experienced defender. But as I've said for two years, to be honest with you, um, you know, for me, he's, he's, he's not 
anywhere near the quality of Carter Vickers. And for us to be a better Champions League team, we need to be aiming that a little bit higher. I'm not, that's not to run down the fact that what I would say is that Starfield improved enormously last season over his first season. And I definitely give him credit for that. But um, at 28, you know, was he going to improve much, yeah, et cetera? And I think even in, you know, with Navrotsky and possibly the, the, the lad from uh, the Swedish league, who both look very promising, very early days. They're both young. If that comes to fruition, you know, we, 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 we no doubt we'll, we'll move forward. But I think it, the, the concern for me is more that when I was thinking about the start of pre-season and thinking about, you know, what does what Brendan and Rogers' to-do list look like what the things that need sorting. There's just an awful lot more to do than I th I thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this is this is another problem that I don't think they probably thought they had to solve. So, you know, I'm not panicking, but there's a couple of weeks left in the transfer window. I just think there's an awful lot to do, uh, and I, and I'm you know we did a lot of good business early in terms of younger players. Um, I thought we'd be a bit further down the road and sorting out some of these problems. And then other problems have come to light since then, like Starfield leaving, etc. And obviously Rogers has been making his mind up about um, some players as well, which could also be further disruption. So, yeah, a lot, a lot more to do. And again, I come back to this sort of theme of change. I think there's a lot more change than what, what I expected, certainly. And this is another one. Well, you know this, I was uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts on Starfield, Alan, because obviously I've been listening to them since he joined the club. Um, and you, you look a lot, obviously, uh, to the data side of it. There's a lot of criticism uh, gone. Starfield's wage during his time at Celtic, mainly in the first season, I've got to say. Uh, but I do, I do think that it's one of these situations where at the beginning of the week, I was looking at it thinking, right, it's OK, because, you know, if we sign a couple this, this week, um, I'll be feeling a wee bit more confident about the whole thing. We've not signed a couple, but we have lost one. And that one that we've lost was a pivotal member of the team over a, a two-year period. So it is at that stage now where I'm a wee bit disappointed that we haven't got more in because I do think we do need to strengthen in a number of positions. Uh, Carol Starfelt, Jim Moore, sorry to see him go. Definitely, yeah. Definitely. I mean, I kind of... Uh... I hear Alan's concerns that he has about the team in general, uh, but but Starfield, I was a big fan of Starfield. I think he got a hard time because he made had, it's such a hard debut at Tynecastle. In contrast to the the new guy in Ruski, you know that's a pretty easy debut to make. Home game, not much of a threat. Stroll through the game, a wee bit, a wee bit, a wee bit sloppy with his passing, but first game fine. But I thought Starfield was just a defender. He wasn't great with the ball at his feet, and I think to play modern football, you have to play with the ball at your feet. He didn't break the lines, he didn't do a lot of things, but what he did do is defend really well. And I thought two pivotal games last season were the two Glasgow derbies at Hamden, and for me, he was the man of the match in both of the games. And, and as I said before, the, the Alec Ferguson phrase is that you know, strikers win your games, defenders win your leagues. And I think the Starfield Carter Vickers partnership shouldn't be underrated. You know, and sometimes it's only when someone leaves you realise actually the fact they were actually quite a good player. You know, I know that maybe Alan will say the stats are only too clever, but if you wanted someone to put to put his head in a ball or put his foot in a ball, he was very, very good at that. So he's a bit of a miss, I think. Uh, in terms of the general situation, I'm a bit concerned about kind of sleepwalking into this season a wee bit. That if you'd have spoke to me after the after the cup semi final, we've just qualified for, for the final, we've just about won the league. Playing Inverness in the cup for him to complete the treble. How confident I was for this season? As I said, nine out of ten. I'm super confident for this season. But all the change that Alan has, that Alan has alluded to there, we've lost a manager that's destabilising. We've lost Jota. Jota's huge. Jota's worth two or three players, basically. And what we saw last Saturday, I think, was the fact that we don't have players at the moment who can take other players on. And we're playing against teams who are defending so deep. We need a bit of creativity. We don't, I mean, bad is good and my ears good, but They've got kind of different qualities, I think. And I'm a bit concerned that we've had a few transfer windows where we had Ange and Michael Nicholson, and they were pretty good in terms of who we bought mm -hmm. and when we bought them. And this time, it doesn't feel like that at all. This team, it looks like, well, we're not really sure what's going to happen. And as you said there, Paul, well, we've lost Starfield. Maybe he wasn't that good, but if we sign two players, but, but if we sign two players, but we don't know who we're going to sign. I think Alan made a really good point last time he was on, talking about that maybe our main rivals are buying players from a certain kind of market where it's easy to get players. And we're after players that maybe are more a bit in demand. So that's a bit mm -hmm. more difficult to get them in. But the thing is, come, <laughs> come 31st of August, if they're not in the door, you know, somebody's to blame for this. And given our financial resources at the moment and the Champions League money to come, you know, I'm not 9 out of 10 anymore. I'm actually back a wee bit to maybe 5 or 6. But then again, I saw... 
we had rugby park last week. That made me a bit more confident. But we can't look at other teams. We look at ourselves. And I think every season, if you've had a good season before, you're looking to become incrementally a wee bit better, I think. And a manager's job, as I said before, is to replace every single player with somebody better, subject to the, the budgetary constraints that, that you have. How have we get incrementally better? Miles off that. We've got significantly weaker, I think. Good enough domestically, miles off it in Europe. I think we still need a few players. But nobody, apart from the centre-back, who's going to be a first-team starter. Uh, interestingly, Brian mentioned home last week. That's the first time I've seen him. He makes Todd Campbell look Schwarzenegger. He was just we, we, we thin guy. Nice touches, don't get me wrong. He had some nice touches, but he needs to bulk up. He's like a wee boy. And I thought from the photographs, he looks like a tough guy, but he's a lot of bulking up to do. So we need first-team guys to walk into the team. We don't have that just now, and that's a bit of a concern for me. All summer, that old negative guy. That old negative guy. <laughs> all summer, though, Jim, I've been talking about it. I think we brought in five. One of them I kind of view as that first team player, and that's uh, Novroski. I think he confirmed was the pronunciation of his name yesterday. Doesn't make it any easier, but cheers anyway, big man. Um, I, I kind of view him as being a, a first pick, a, a first team jersey. The other four. Listen, tell me if I'm wrong. I just think that there have been moves that are already in the post and they've arrived, you know, after Brendan's taken over. There, there's little bags of promises. Jim says there's obviously progression to be done um, physically, but also, you know, in terms of just building the, the confidence of these guys up. They've come from Norway, they've come from Australia, they've come from South Korea. It's going to take time, I think, for those four players uh, to really bed themselves in. Uh, Novroski doesn't have that time. He's got to hit the ground running, to use that old cliche, Brian. Uh, we were talking earlier about partnerships, and that's a big part of the staff felt departure, isn't it? The fact that him and Carter Vickers had this partnership, the best defensive partnership since who? in your opinion, Brian? Because I, I'll tell you one that, that wasn't popular at the time, but when you look back, you realise that it was a very successful partnership, was McManus and Caldwell. They got some slagging week to week, didn't they? But they did okay. Yeah, listen, I've mentioned them before, and as uh, long-term viewers know, that's that's one of my favourite teams under Gordon Strachan. I still think that he's still the most underrated Celtic manager, and I think they're probably the most underrated team for how they performed last 16 twice. Be Colin McManus, and I tell you about Colwell as well. If he was playing ten years later, lots of teams would want him because his, you know, his use of the ball was excellent. Passing was very, very good for the back. It just was not quite maybe in the right era. Um, but in terms of partnerships, look, maybe I've been harsh, but I think the key part of the Carter Vickers and Starfield partnership was Carter Vickers. You know, I don't think when Carter Vickers played Starfield looked amazing, if I'm honest. I think they dropped a lot of points when he didn't play. Whereas I think if Carter Vickers played in Starfield, didn't he? I think we were still largely okay. So I think there's a factor in that. Um, and it's interesting as well. I've got to kind of disagree about some of the signings because... So say we're, we're looking at, you know, bringing in players that are, are better than we've got, right? I always think we should be aiming to do that, but mm -hmm. we don't know what these players are like yet. It's still the early days. And if we are saying, well, if we value Hitati eight or nine million, in theory, then we need to pay ten million to get somebody better. But we can't pay ten million for one player. So what you need to do is you need to find someone that's potentially better. And that's why I think these guys come in because if you look at Hitati and O'Reilly in particular, nobody really knew much about them. If we'd had a decent squad at the time, people would have said the exact same about them. The difference was we were really struggling for numbers at the time. And needed to, to get bulked up. Now we've got players in. And I just, my concern is that we, we keep talking about these marquee signings or these project players. And I don't necessarily believe that, you know, just because someone's young or maybe not made their name in one of the top leagues, they're necessarily a project player. I think they're players that can add to the squad. And I think we'll see that over time. I do agree we're, a bit, we're weaker without Jota. And I still think that's the area where we need that sort of maverick up front, especially in the wide areas that we don't really have. I think Abada's going to be a lot better this season, but he's still not that type of Jota player. So I think that's an area I'm slightly concerned about. But defensively, um, Mirovsky, a, a big Mike, might just call him Mick, make it easy. Big Mick. Um, you know, there's nothing to suggest that he's any better or worse than Starfield at this stage. We've got the Lagerbeel, Pesley coming in, who 
to be fair, does look very good and very highly rated. We don't know if they're going to be better or not. I think time's going to have to tell. And if we get to the end of the season and we'll feel spectacularly and none of these guys have stepped up, then we can hold our hands up. But I think the reality is we're not going to sign players of great value in terms of monetary value at this stage. And I don't think we're going to be getting really massively established internationals to come in and replace the players that are there. I think they have to try and pick from a certain market and hope to sell them on. And I think that's just the reality. It's a good point in relation to Jota because obviously the, the, the player we signed uh, versus the player that we that we dispatched there for a huge profit um, it took two years for that transition, didn't it? And so I absolutely get that there is a need and a, and a necessity actually, unless you're pr- producing your own young players, which we are evidently not, to bring in guys of that age group, develop them, build them up, and some of them will surprise you and end up in the first team. And I think in, in the, four, the four that I mentioned there, it would not surprise me if one or two of them ended up as staple parts of the side this season. You know, they'll show us what they've got. From what I've seen, you know, Jim, unfortunately, hasn't seen Quan. From what I've seen so far, I'm not writing him off, but I think it's going to take him a wee bit of time to come up to the, the kind of standards that he needs to, to get into this side. Home, I've been pretty impressed with. I think uh, Yang has looked pretty direct and immediate, you know, the impact that he's made so far. So I look forward to it. I'm going to come to you, though, Lloyd, in relation to one of the points Brian made about the um, this tendency to look at a partnership sometimes as uh, weak and strong, if you like. You know, it's, a lot of people said that about Van Dyke and Denier, didn't they? Um, Starfelt and Carter Vickers. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to actually go back to the point Jim made. I did feel that there was a couple of games last season where Starfelt really did step up and Carter Vickers wasn't you know, beside them. Um, but the proof will be in the pudding. What's your take on it in terms of the partnership? I'm more, to be honest with you, I'm more upset that the partnership's been broken up than I am that Starfield was left, if that makes sense. Yeah, it kind of does make sense in that aspect. Um, I'm, I'm kind of gutted that Starfield's went because it was good for uh, any time goal scorer from my point of view. But, well, that's a, I need to pick a new one now. But anyway, uh, as for the partnership, it speaks for itself. They were unbeaten every time they played in the league. So, remarkable. What, what, more can, what more can you say about that? Every time they played together, they were unbeaten. As Jim rightly said as well, there was certain games, e.g., the semi final against Rangers, Starfelt was one of the best players on the pitch that day as well. So, you, you do also miss the individual performance. And sometimes when Kobe Asher came in, he kind of covered the both positions to kind of guide Kobe Asher as well. But you just need to see what Mike Narovsky's got about him. I mean, hopefully that partnership blossoms as well, the same way it did with Carl Bickers and Starfield. Yeah, you do hope so. I want to actually speak uh, briefly about where it leaves us in that position as well, because uh, when Novrosky came in, I'm thinking that's great. You know, if we bring in at that point Lagerbilk, then I'm, I'm really confident about that area of the park. And then you're looking at some of the others and what we're going to do in terms of a loan deal maybe for for young Lawal, what happens with Kobayashi, what happens with Welsh, and then hopefully we'll hear a wee bit more about that. If you're viewing a, this particular live stream on uh, Facebook, thank you for your thumbs up. You can share it. If you're watching it on Twitter, which I still call Twitter, Twitter, because <laughs> X seems a bit strange mm-hmm. to call it X. I mean, what do you call a retweet? Seriously. It's just Repost. like post. A repost. A repost. Mm-hmm. Right, okay, eventually I will... Start calling it X, but uh, in the meantime, if you're watching on Twitter, you can repost it, um, make your comments, and obviously we will keep bringing them up. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. A thousand strong on this Friday afternoon. We're a couple of days away from uh, match day two up at Pataji. We've got a particularly good record under Brendan Rogers previously, anyway, against their opponents. How do you see it going? Let us know in the comments section. How do you feel about the uh, transfer window so far? I got told off on Facebook yesterday. Uh, Alan, they said to me, well, it's not finished yet. Windows not closed yet, so I'm not commenting. And I'm thinking, you can still talk about it as we sit here right now. You don't want it to be a mad panic at the end. You know what I mean? I know it's exciting for Sky Sports and all that, but you want to have all your positions in place. Big shout out to Andrew for supporting the channel. Despite goals for Bull, uh, we are much better with Rio. If David Trumbull gets uh, Rio's minutes this year, that is a clear and significant downgrade of the squad. What's your thoughts, Alan Morrison, if you're going to be looking at the data and the stats? Um, I know that he made an impact. Can't argue with that. I tend to agree with the the theory, perhaps, that O'Reilly played a better game, but I can see why David Trumbull got the man of the match. However, long-term or even medium-term, 
surely that that's it's better to have Rio in the site. Okay, just for just for answer, try and answer that uh, quick quiz question: Which was the centre back partnership that broke the Scottish clean sheets record? Right. Okay, that's a good question. That um, could you give us an era? Is it fairly it modern? Wasn't that long ago? Probably, yeah, it was this century, sort of middle middle-ish. Try to think who would have been the goalie. Was it? Oh, it was Fraser Foster who was in goals, wasn't it? Am I right? Kelvin Wilson and somebody. Mulgrew and Wilson, was it not? Was it? Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm, but I'm it's not, definitely not, not prolonging. It, 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 it was definitely That's, Foster. Foster Van, da, Foster Van, Van Dyke, Dyke and Ambrose. Denier. Ambrose. 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 Baghetti. Yes. Could you, you check your stats, <laughs> Alan? Could you just double check your stats there? <laughs> He's still playing. <laughs> Queen of the side. She was in quiet there. Yeah. She was in quiet there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what so was the record? Just, How many minutes? Just, How many just, minutes was that? Oh, I can't remember. It was was it, was, it some, was it something like thirteen games or nearly fourteen? I can't remember how many. It was, it was around about that, 13, 14 games maybe. But yeah, it was Van so Dyke the, and Ambrose and uh, Foster and Go. So the theory that Van Dyke anyway. could make anyone look good is actually true, right? Okay, that's fine. I, I, will, yes. I, will, I will go to anything to avoid talking, to, talking about Rio Hatati. To be honest with you, so um, listen, a lot of people <laughs> think that central midfield is, is Celtic's strongest part of the. Uh, team, I, I'm of the view that it's actually potentially our weakest part of the team. And again, when I when we have these conversations, when I have these conversations, when I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about it in terms of, you know, going to St. Johnson, beating them, or winning at home to Ross County. I'm talking about how can we compete at Champions League level. That is the benchmark we have to use, and that's the lens through which I judge or try and assess these players in that sense. So I still think we're, we're, whether it's Turnbull or Hitati, it doesn't matter. We're still some way short from a Champions level, Champions League level competitive midfield. I don't mean winning the Champions League. I just mean being competitive at that level. We're still we're still uh, some way short. You know the the biggest weakness in Celtic's team, right? And and it's not me telling you this. It's every single manager in Scotland, right? Because what did every single team in Scotland do? Attack Celtic's left hand side. Right, and yeah. that left-hand side, which was, you know, McGregor holding in the middle, Hitati on the left, Taylor at left back, and Starfelt as left centre back, is was 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 so obviously the weakest part of Celtic's team, and that's the bit that everybody attacked, and so you know we need to address that because you know at Champions League level we just get ripped apart. I know I know Jim doesn't like preseason friendlies. There's still little bits of them that can be instructive. I think the Wolves game was hugely instructive for Rogers. He knew Wolves. He knows the players. He knows yeah. their strengths. And therefore, he could make judgments about how the Celtic players played in in relation to that. And and we, we were absolutely ripped apart down the left hand side. M McGregor, Hatati, Taylor just physically couldn't keep up with the Wolves players. The power, the pace, which is going to be very similar to what we see in the Champions League in terms of the physicality and athleticism of those players, also with the um, the the quality as well, not just athletes. So that's the area of the pitch I think we need massively need, uh, and that's more than just a Rio Hatati versus Turnbull um, conversation because I don't think Turnbull solves that problem either. You know, you, you know, there's certain uh, things that aren't going to change. Turnbull's not going to get quicker. Taylor's not going to get quicker. The, neither of them are going. I mean, Taylor's a fantastic athlete. He'll run all day long, but he yeah. doesn't have that high end speed. He's not going to get taller. He's not going to get stronger. You know, and, and that and we need all those things, that whole package, and it's difficult. It's so difficult, but you need that package to compete. So I'm not, I'm not, and all, all those players that I've mentioned are perfectly capable of winning Celtic the SPFL, no doubt about it. But are they capable of getting Celtic into that third, third uh, Champions League spot? Never mind second. That's where I think we've we've got the issues still. And then, as I say, debating Turnbull v Hitati is to me is, is is not is not the debate. It's, it's a wider debate than that about that that part of the team. Mm. And it's interesting you, you say that because I mean I'm guilty of it as well. And I'm looking at areas of the, the the side Alan that I think need strengthened. I very rarely look at the midfield. I just think we've got so many quality players in there. But I know we've spoken about it a few times now about the fact that you step up and some of the midfields you're playing against are basically just a, a completely different level. Um, and so it's interesting. Do you think there's anyone in there that, that does pass the test? Is there a player of quality that, that can, you know, translate their performances from the domestic game to the Champions League and, and not be out of kind of touch with that, that we already have possess? I think, you know, um, you know Matt O'Reilly was mentioned earlier. He's definitely somebody because of, you know, just in, in his intelligence, his technicality, his touch. 
his, his vision, his awareness. He's also you know, relatively good athlete as well. His pressing skills are very underrated as well. By the way, I know he's not the quickest, but he presses. After Maeda, he's the second best presser in in the squad. So I think he's definitely one. Um, there is a thorny there is a thorny topic which I'll get pelters for raising, but we do have to start thinking about you know how long does Cal McGregor become the player that we always pick first on the team sheet and plays every single game. I don't, it's not a subject, you know, I've, I've been through the scars with the Scott Brown conversation. Um, I hope people reflect back on that and see that, you know, we did play Brown for far too long. I don't want to be having that conversation about Callum McGregor, but I'm making the assumption that, that Callum McGregor will play and he's going to play every game in Europe. Therefore, I'm, I'm kind of okay with O'Reilly beside him, but then who do you put? I don't see anyone else in the squad today that, that will give us what we need at that Champions League level. Again, you could put anyone in there home to Ross and I'm not too worried about it. But away to Leipzig, you know, away in the Bernabeu, you know, that's that's what you've got to think. How can we be more competitive in that area? And I think it is an area we still need we still need to be strengthened in. You know, when you talk about ruthlessness and uh, managerial ruthlessness, and, and I guess we're talking about a wee bit of that in the tackling today, dropping Rio Hatate, obviously the, that's about performance. It's about seeing what he's done in the, the pre-season and thinking, no, you're not starting the first game against Ross County because I think David Turnbull's on better form. Dropping Bernabe because he slept in. We've all slept in from time to time, guys. <laughs> but obviously that ruthlessness. And a big part of that, Jim, is about removing the emotion from it, isn't it? I remember... You'll remember as well, and I think it was the Hamden season. Tommy Burns was the first manager ever to drop Paul McStay. McStay had missed games, not many through suspension, it's got to be said. He had missed games through injury. And I remember there being a big furore around the fact that Paul McStay was dropped. Somebody in the comments will tell me the game. I'm going to say it was against Hibs at home, home being Hamden Park. But not only was McStay, you know, so revered, he was the captain of the club at the time, and it was a very difficult season, and Tommy Burns dropped him. He was fully fit to play, and he was the first manager ever to do it. Uh, so it must be a, a very tough thing to do as a manager, Jim, or is that really the, the uh, you know, that shows you the fibre of a manager if they don't think it's tough, you know, to be that ruthless, remove the emotion out of it? I think it's dead simple. I think if you pick a team and they win the game, you pick the right team. So end of, no matter who you're playing in that particular team, to pick up the point Alan was making, every time you play these teams in Europe, you look at their players and you think they've got the physicality, mm. they've got the athleticism, they've got the experience. Why do other guys have that? <laughs> you know. So, you know, and Alan, uh, Brian mentioned home, and I'm thinking, he looks like a wee boy. Yeah, he does look like a wee boy. I mean, he could be most skillful player in the world, I don't know. But if you come up against these guys who've got the physicality and the athleticism and the experience, we tend to struggle a bit. And I think there's a huge leap between who we're playing in the SPFL in European football, never mean Champions League, Europa League, or Conference League, there's a huge leap when you see those kind of players. And that's the kind of players I think we should be to try and say. I think we could do with a bit more experience in the team. An old head at the back, a kind of Pat Stanton to show how old I am type of thing, whereby you get somebody who can have, not just as a good defender, but has an influence on the whole team. A Joe Hart type thing where he's obviously got a bigger influence than just being a goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see a bit of that, but we don't tend to sign those kind of Older players, we tend to go for dead young guys, and so we don't know what we're going to get. And that was the point I was I was trying to make that if you lose Jota, you're you're losing who's guaranteed great, and we bring in somebody who we don't really know. If we kept Jota and brought somebody else, then you think, okay, fair enough, let's see how that works out. But we're replacing really good players with maybe's. It might work out, but to answer the question, you're the manager. You pick the team that's going to get you the three points. They're going to get you through the next round of the cup. And if you win the game, you've picked the right team. And if you don't win the game, you've got a lot of explaining to do. And I think the more quality players you've got, uh, the more of a choice you've got. But that's a but that's a good headache to have. Uh, whoever we pick on Sunday, if we win the game, that's the right team. Whether you or I think it's the right team or not, you come back with three points, that's the right team. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Alan froze there. I don't know if he was just standing like that for a minute. He froze, so he might be back. If he comes back in, obviously, we'll welcome him back into the fold. Big shout out to everybody who's tuning in. A thousand on this Friday afternoon. We're all buzzing about uh, the league campaign being underway. Keith Oakden, hello, all from Plymouth. Keith, don't you normally say sunny Plymouth? Where's the summer, you say? Hail, hail. Hail, hail with you as well. Sir, ridiculizer can't argue with Turnbull's goals. It's his shirt to lose at the moment. You know, this is the... 
for me, this is the big question. Hatati uh, unceremoniously dropped. You can't, you know, explain it any other way. You can't describe it any other way. He was dropped. Turnbull's come in. He scored a couple of goals. He, he got a secondary assist. I think he showed pretty good nerves. He still actually uh, with the penalty. Laura pointed that out. So I would be hugely surprised if he was to be dropped. However, if he goes into the game against Aberdeen and doesn't turn it on, then it completely changes your view, doesn't it? Andrew, Turnbull, a good player, but not a patch on Hatate, especially in Europe. And I do think that we've got Alan coming back. There we go, Alan. Uh, you've changed position. You're now playing centre forward alongside Alan, uh, alongside Jim. You were relegated well. recently. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, Brian, I think that makes you left back, mate. Right, so Andrew. Uh, reckons he's not a patch on a tatty, especially in Europe. And uh, we've also got Claths, 1978. Good year, that. Kyogo links with Spurs will go into overdrive now. Harry looks to be away. Uh, that's jumping a wee bit ahead, but we'll speak about it anyway, because James McKenzie and I had a wee chat about that earlier on regarding the, the Harry Kane uh, move or, or the uh, supposed move to Bayern Munich. I think that's maybe in the works. And... Um, a few headlines going on about Kyogo and Spurs, and I'm going to ask you first, Brian, I don't buy that. I don't think that Spurs will be looking, as much as I love Kyogo, as love, as much as I'd be devastated for him to leave, they're not looking at Kyogo to replace Harry Kane. He's not even, in the, he's not even on, on the short list or, or the long list, is he? No, I, I wouldn't imagine so. It's almost the, the, the opposite of the conversation we're having. If you look at the, the physicality and the intensity, um, the athleticism you need to play in the Premier League, you know, we don't have loads of players that can match that to the point we made about European. And Kyogo will probably match it in terms of, you know, technique and movement and stuff. He, I think he would do a job there, but there's no way there that's going to be the assignment to place Harry Kane. It just won't. The arrogance of the league would stop them doing it, even if, you know, analytics and stats would also stop them. So I think that's about your own starter, to be fair. Um, in terms of the Hitati versus Turnbull argument, it de- when you say like who's a better player, it depends on what you decide is a good player. Do you know what I mean? It depends on like is it you know so Hitati's you know a bit faster, he's clever passing and stuff like that. But it, to Alan's point, he's defensively maybe no fantastic. He doesn't score the goals that Turnbull scores. I think Turnbull technically is very very good. I think he's very underrated. I think his passing is good. He's physically a bit bigger. Does that make him a better player? I think it depends on the, the team and the situation. So I think it's a bit of an unfair comparison. But what you would say is, I think the, the commentator, I can't remember his name, so apologies, but I think it is Turnbull's shot to lose. And I think Rogers was quite clear about that when he basically said, you know, it's up to him. You know, mm-hmm. if he wants a new contract, he wants to stay at the club, he wants to keep playing, then he just has to play well. And in that regard, it's kind of simple, right? And that's what you want to see. And I liked, you know, Roger's comments, I don't know if it was today, but when he was asked about you, when he said, you know, I'm not contracted to play any player. The players will play on merit and they play the fit the system. And that's exactly the attitude you should have. Um, I'm interested. So I'd said at the start of the, this, the pre-season that I thought Burnaby would be a better option at left back than Taylor. And it's not a hell I'm keen to die on, but I still think that could be the case if he gets the working time. Which clearly he didn't the other day, um, and I've got to be fair. As someone who's a bit of a, a you know, a bit of a timekeeping um, fiend, that would annoy me as well. So I'd have dropped him too. But I think he's the closest to that sort of athletic fullback we've got that Alan was referring to. Um, and then just on the, the physicality thing, I think just looking at the comments, I think when people talk about the physicality and athleticism, it doesn't mean you need to be one yammer. It's about the pace you can cover, the ground you can cover, the speed you can do it at. And players can be strong and fast and effective in positions without being big. I think it's there's other aspects to it. So I don't think anyone's suggesting we need a team of rugby players. But, you know, if you look at guys like Kante, Modric, you know, Cross isn't a huge guy, but they're incredibly athletic. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to get to that calibre, but I don't think we should judge a book by mm. how they look physically. I think there'll be other aspects to it. But again... It goes back to my point I made earlier about the type of players we can buy. I think every club with any European ambition is all looking at the same players. They're all looking for guys that are super fast, super strong, can cover ground and can play with the ball at their feet. But 
the teams that are looking at them have either better scouting systems or far more money to throw or they're playing better leagues. So we're always up against it. So I know want to feel as if I'm, I'm super defending the club's transfer policy, but I think there is a realism of the type of player we can get, even if we identify. So does that have to take into account as well? I always go back, right, and I'm sorry for doing it in advance, I apologise. I always go back to the going for the 10 in a row um, pre-season, whereby, you know, I think back to the announcements. I think back to, all right, we've spent 5 million quid, Lloyd, on a on a goalie um, who's got Champions League and international experience. Great, everybody's buzzing. I've not checked it yet, but I'm pretty sure many, many tweets have been deleted underneath that announcement. Um, Albin Ayeti signs, we sign a, a striker who scored, loads of goals in you know uh, Switzerland international player we're signing him from West Ham five million quid boom there's another set everybody's buzzing we signed a left back from AC Milan we signed Shane Duffy and it was a disaster so on the one hand you know you you really do have the the uh, the thirst for more and more signings constantly through this transfer window social media feeds that thirst doesn't it um, but I think Celtic have shown a really patient approach I can understand why some people are saying we've gone back to the the signing policy of old, where everything takes an age. We miss out on, you know, players due to a few hundred grand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I do get that, but I'm going to go back to the point. Brendan Rodgers wouldn't have walked into that movie, would he, Lloyd? He's walked into a situation where he knows the strategy suits him. Yeah, he does. He's also had to assess the squad as well and know what players he wants to keep. It's not just about straight away. All right, we'll spend five, six million pound this player and that player. He wants to look at every single player and make sure he's doing the right thing for that team. Certain players like Turnbull, Abada, even O'Reilly, you're seeing now, Brendan's coaching is starting to have an impact on them. So mm-hmm. would you replace them in that team? I wouldn't. But are you going to spend five, six million pounds, get another type of O'Reilly or Abada? Not necessarily, because you look at a Yeti, Barkas, they don't guarantee that they're going to be great players. You could spend five million pounds in an absolute dud. And then you're strong and then they're not going to leave the club. So what position do you really want to be in? You're right. I mean, the £5 million is one part of it, Lloyd. Look how mm-hmm. much back has cost. We've, we've then had to tear up his contract. So I don't know what the percentage will be, but we've had to pay him wages for the remainder of his contract. I'll be in a yet he's sitting there thinking, I'm going to dig my heels in. I'm just going to sit here and no play until the end of my contract. I mean, I've heard everything from 15 to 21 grand in terms of a weekly wage for him. But the five million quid's the first part of the expenditure. Then you've got a player who has a flop, who has a dud, and they're just going to sit there and kick their heels on the bench. Yeah, you know what? Celtic have to take responsibility for that. We, you know, we're it when it comes down to it. And the player's in within his rights to do that. I don't think it's good for any footballer's career to do that. But that that is a, another argument. I'm going to speak then about you know, lining up on Sunday. Um, if we go through the team, then many other debates will be had in relation to should he stay, should he go, do we need to bring in uh, replacements, etc. And I'm going to start off, because we started off with Starfelt, we've already touched on centre-half partnership. There's no real doubt, Jim, is there that obviously Carter Vickers starts. I think Novroski will be the first pick at this moment. But what does it mean for others such as Kobayashi, and such as Stephen Welsh. I think that Welsh will be away. It's time for him to move on. Six games last season isn't enough for a boy of his age. Kobayashi, however, is a wee bit more of a dilemma. What do you do with these guys? I've wrote it down Novrovsky. I can see it. Brilliant. He goes with the same team. I mean, that's the team he played last week. He's going to go with it again. He's not going to change the team. I don't think uh, this early in the season. And until we get players who we can walk into the first team or we get injuries, I think the team we picked last week is the team. And David Turnbull scoring his two goals, as the person said earlier, he's not going to drop him after that. I think, uh, yeah, I think Sunday's team picks itself. And what would you do with Kobayashi? Because I think he, there was a good blog actually on axom.net, link under the video, there's your shameless plug. There was a good blog yesterday by James McKenzie talking about Kobayashi, the, the curious case of Kobayashi who came in very highly rated. We asked our um, a resident expert, Liam Carrigan, all about him. He rated him highly, never got started. And I don't think dropping him and then, you know, for a, for a midfielder for the cup final, for example, would have done his confidence any good. But what do you do with him, Jim? I think we've got a League Cup game the next week. I think we're at Kilmarnock next week. There's a game to play him. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the league's the most important thing. I think the League Cup is something where you try some of your fringe players. So I think you can come in for that. He's definitely a backup player. That's all he is. And I think uh, 
if you're saying the guy that we're getting uh, linked with, then he becomes even further down the pecking order. But you need a bit of strength and depth. Uh, I think the game at Ibrox set him back significantly. I think up to that yeah. point, you were looking at him thinking, well, he's, he's going to be the ball at his feet. Again, he maybe lacks a bit of physicality. Mm -hmm. and, he get, and, he get, and he get bullied that game. And you thought, well, you can't go back to the Ibrox with him there. So there is some doubt about his future, whether it's better for him to be loaned out somewhere to try and maybe, maybe toughen him up. A la Liam Skills, uh, uh, maybe that's an option for the bit. If we get another young centre half, and then he's well doing the pecking and order. And but who knows? Because the other thing is, is that this, I'm assuming he's not involved in the Asian Cup when that comes around. If you're not going to game for Celtic, I can't imagine he's playing that game as well. That's a bit of a concern. I mean, I don't know how that works. Do we do we get to cancel games if we get X number of players? Alan, you would know better than me how that works. The Asian Cup. Do we get to cancel games at that point in time if there's too many players away? I think you can cancel a maximum of three games, can't you? And how many games would it cover if they do well? Mm. If Japan well, and Korea do well? Exactly. So you have to think with that in mind as well that, you know, that maybe, yeah, he's definitely back up. He's further down the pecking order. Uh, maybe going out and loads a good idea. Stephen Welsh is there. Uh, yeah, if you're Stephen Welsh, you must wonder what you do next. Because uh, he's obviously not in the manager's thinking. I think it'd be good if he went out and loan as well, again, to try and get back experience. Because at his age, he should have played a lot more games. Maybe mm -hmm. not for Celtic, but certainly a lot more games for someone. But uh, Kobayashi, they will do in the pecking order. And if he's still there next week, maybe playing rugby park against a good rugby park front too. They were, they were, again, they were, they, were, they were dead impressive last week. So, uh, yeah, further in the pecking order for the Kobayashi. Yeah. I think uh, McInnes has bought well. Um, you know, it's taken him a wee while to to obviously put his stamp on that side, but he'll do well at Kilmarnock. I'm going to ask you, similarly, Alan, when you look at the centre-half position, you know, we're linked with Lager Bielk, we're, we're linked with uh, Mew Yamba as well, Xavier Mew Yamba. If we bring one or two in, look at the roll call, right? So we've got Carter Vickers and Novroski, who you're kind of guessing are your top two. Then you've got your backups, you've got Welsh skills, uh, Yuki Kobayashi and um, Bossom Lawal, right? So you've got six and we're looking to bring in one, maybe two. We don't need eight, <laughs> you know, and if you're bringing two in, they're obviously going to be at the forefront of bolstering the squad, maybe giving them some game time. Where does it leave that other four, Welsh skills, uh, Kobayashi and Lawal for you? Because I just, you know, I'm of the view, I said it yesterday and a few people said we don't need two. It looks like we're going to bring two in. And if we bring two in, then, you know, I think at least two need to go out permanently. Maybe the other two out on loan. Yeah, so I, I think Kobayashi is relatively straightforward in the sense that he's a, he's a young player. Um, clearly, you know, the physicality of the Scottish game is is does it just takes time to adjust to. Uh, and I think we saw him struggle a little bit with that. He looks like a good passer of the ball. He's left-footed. I'd like to see him maybe go out on loan somewhere. Not necessarily back to Japan. I think that would be like almost giving up on him. But you know, send him out on loan to a league where he can, you know, get used to perhaps a faster, more physical game and see how he does. I think the curious one is Welsh. You know, Stephen Welsh is a player who's never really let Celtic down. He's been there, you know, a long time. He's a good, solid player. Um, again, you know, obviously there, there are some limitations. He's not the biggest. He's not the quickest. Um, he's a pretty good passer of the ball. I don't think, as I say, I don't think he's ever let the team down when he's played, but he's never going to be quite good enough yet to be first choice. I think it's more for him to decide what he wants his future to be. Because I think, you know, I think if some good clubs have been interested in him in the past, he could probably carve out a good career, you know, follow the, you know, the, it'd be fascinating to see him follow the path of Lewis Ferguson and Doig and uh, Aaron Hickey yeah. and, you know, make it a decent Italian team. That, I think that would be brilliant for Scotland, for example. Um, I would be sad to lose him at Celtic. I think he's a good backup. I think he helps us on the, the homegrown player count as well. So he's the he's the one I think that's got the most complexity around in terms of what what's the best outcome here, both for himself and for the and for the club. Um, Lowell, I think the decision is you know we've got this hookup with um, Admira Wacker in in, mm -hmm. in uh, Austria. I don't think we've known yet which young players are going to be potentially going there to be sort of farmed out to their, hopefully be competing in their first team in the Austrian uh, Bundesliga 2. Um, whether Lal will be one of those, that might be a good next step for him, again, just to get competitive first team football. Because, you know, we've got to find creative ways to bridge the gap between playing you know, University of Stirling students and 
top class professional football. It's got to be there has to be a way. And it's Scottish football isn't going to solve that problem. So Celtic have to solve that problem for our young players. You know, the, the structure is inadequate, the structure is not fit for purpose. Celtic as one club cannot on their own change that. So we have to find creative ways to get meaningful minutes for um our younger players. So you know, I hope you know, I hope La- if Lal isn't deemed quite ready for the first team, hopefully, again, he finds a loan in a good, decent club playing at a decent level where he can play competitive, um, you know, full-time professional football. Um, and, 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 you know, to your point then, where does that leave us? Um, it does it does leave us short. I think even if we get um, um, Lagerbielke in, there's potentially another one, depending on, the, on, on what, what happens with Welsh, Kobayashi and Lal, there's potentially even another one that you might you might think uh, would would be. I, mean, I don't know what happened to Dane Murray, by the way. The, I know he had a bad injury. I don't know if he's back fit, yeah. whether he's recovered, whether he's playing again. I'm not seeing. I think I saw him play one game for the the B team, but uh, over the last period. But I, I don't know if he's still around the team or what have you. Whether there's anyone else that can step up to be that fourth centre back. Um, I'd like it to be Welsh, to be honest with you. In which case, you know, we don't need to buy a fourth person. But, but as I say, I think, as you say, with his age, I think there's a lot to think about there. Yeah, there definitely is. He can't go another season and play six games of football for Celtic. But you're right, we've done everything we can in, in relation to trying to get a team in the pyramid. But, you know, there's a real resistance to allow that team to progress out of the fifth tier. And Welsh, it's sitting in the fifth tier. The players are not going to develop for the first team. Absolutely not. Charlie McGarvey. Uh, Bobo did that and some fans still love him. You're talking about digging your heels in. Yeah, he did, didn't he? I think he played about one game in 18 months or something. Um, and uh, he says, I am the CEO of Bobo Baldi. Peter Lobo was the CEO of Celtic Football Club. And I think that spoke volumes uh, when Big Baldi wasn't getting a game. Gordon Strachan um, conceded earlier last month, actually, that you know on day one, at training, he did make it on time, unlike Bernabe, but he was on his phone in the dressing room trying to get a transfer to Middlesbrough. Um, and everybody's wondering where he was on the training pitch. Tom or Tam, sorry, Hunter, why not play McGregor Hatati Turnbull? I think it's because O'Reilly, as Alan said before, O'Reilly deserves the jersey. I mean, O'Reilly's played really well, and I think he played really well last week as well. Uh, Plunge McNugget, I think that's still in the works, isn't it? Scales to Aberdeen, although probably on loan uh, because there will be a fee attached to any permanent transfer for Scales to go there. Um, So, yeah, very interesting points everybody's having in relation to this. I'm going to ask you a wee question, though. We've spoken about um, Jota leaving, and I've suggested that his replacement's already in the building, his replacement's a badder. And again, James McKenzie says, but who's going to replace a badder's figures? Because obviously, he was contributing sizably when it comes to goals and assists. Um, I think that already we've heard, I'll come to you first, Lloyd, we've heard about Brendan having his wee sit-down chats. It seems to be that, you know, it's like um, the same kind of response of um, spinach to Popeye. You know, you sit down with Brendan Rodgers and you get this boost because he fills you full of hope and and, uh, belief. Abadders looked good so far for me. He looks as though he's bulked up as well physically. And uh, it looks like there's a real intent that this is going to be a big season for him. Do you do you see that so far? Yeah, I think last week in my predictions when I put on X, formerly known as Twitter, that I think a bad will be player of the year this season. So mm-hmm. I'm expecting really big things from him this year. Yeah, I, I just, I mean, I, I've spoken previously about Hatati, the transformation, Brian, and Hatati physically. And you can see it, you know, just if you look at the, the arrival press conference that we were at com- compared to where he is now, he has transformed physically. Um, Abada coming as a young 19-year-old, how often did we say that? Oh, you forget he's only 19. I think he's maybe 21 now, so we need to change the record. But his performances so far, for me, look as though th- there's a desire, um, there's a real intent. And he was a guy I expected to lose this preseason. Yeah, I think we all sort of... We all made the assumption that Bada was off, and um, but I'm glad that they'll be, be a, make the assumption now that he's staying. But yeah, I think he'll be excellent. I think what you see is you might see him get pushed out to the left, because you know Rogers does like full backs to overlap mm-hmm. and he wants to cut in. So I think you see him cutting his right foot. His, his goal should be consistent. Um, and in terms of the, the, the Jota situation, I said earlier, I do think we need someone of that ilk, but. We've got Yang and Tilio, and we don't know what they're like. Yeah. And again, bear in mind, we didn't know what Jota was like when we signed him either. So, you know, they might be the new Jota, they might be better. We certainly don't know yet. 
Um, and I think, you know, when we talked about the, the type of players we've signed, I was just thinking about the, the sort of physicality and clearly they're trying to address that to a degree. I think Yang's a, a really big guy for a winger. I think he's got a really strong work ethic. Kwon, we don't know what he's going to be like. He was decent against Wolves and absolutely rotten against uh, Bilbao. Um, but again, big physical player. Iwata is a really physical player. Maybe not the tallest, but very, very strong, very mobile. Um, and the defenders, well, again, we don't know if they're coming in, but Lagerbeek's 6'3", I think. And I would just got, I'm not going to try his second name, so it's got Big Xavier, Big Professor X is uh, six foot five or so. So you can see there's a clear attempt to address that. Um, and, but again, regarding Jota's replacement, we, we don't know what Yang is going to be like. We don't know what Taylor is going to be like. And we don't know if someone else is going to come in. So it's a bit of a, a watching brief, I think, to use a, a, a corporate phrase. Um, but it'd be good to see. And again, I, I'm I'm really excited to see it. I don't think Rogers came in with his eyes shut. You know, I know he professes his love for the club, but he never came back unless he knew he was going to have what he demanded. He never came back unless he knew he was going to win and win well and take that a step above. It, it, it's, there's no way he would have came back otherwise. So I think we have to sort of have a bit of faith in the process and see where it ends up. And if it gets to December, I'm in the same position, then we can criticise. But I think so, I kind of wait and see. And I've got, I have got faith that, you know, even regardless what you think of Brendan the man, Brendan the manager is not going to let his ego be destroyed by a club that's not going to fulfil his ambitions. I think he's come back very confident with a plan. And I think we will see that. It's just a matter of wait and see. The thing with that, Brian, I'm pretty sure Brennan Rogers isn't ready to uh, hang his uh, suit up after his three years at Celtic. He'll have other ambitions, won't he? He wants to be a success, uh, not just in the next three years. He wants to be a success moving on from Celtic. And I don't want to look too far ahead, but you know, there's no way you can come to Celtic, not be a success, and then get back into the EPL, for example. I, I can't see that happening. So... He's a guy that, you know, he's all about brand Brendan as well. Uh, I think he has changed a wee bit. We don't know what um, chapter two of the Danny McGrain saga um, <laughs> involved. I'll need to wait, Jim, until we get Danny back on a stage at some point and we'll ask him. Um, Alan, mm. in terms of data, analytics, figures, um, where are you with the badder? It's time now, isn't it, for him to be a, a consistent uh, fixture in the Celtic team. Does he have it in him? I think he does. Yeah, a keep saying hopefully consistently you know i know that like a lot of players at celtic he's got his faults you know some of his decision making you know he doesn't have the the tricks to of, of a traditional winger i see him more as a, a sort of wide forward really almost like a, a sort of false striker more than i would classify him as a winger i think his strengths are you know his his timing and arrival of when to get on the ball in the box his finishing is very good with both feet He's actually a lot more creative than than perhaps people realise as well. Um, you know, his pressing isn't great. I mean, we saw against Ross County, <laughs> first 15 minutes, they attacked relentlessly down Celtic's right-hand side. Um, you know, and Ralston was kind of fighting a bit on his own in terms of uh, the numbers coming down that side. So, you know, there are definitely areas for his game to improve. But in terms of sheer um, attacking productivity in terms of things like expected goals expected assists which is sort of key the key sort of signature metrics if you like he's just he's probably as i keep saying uh, i suspect of 21 and under players playing in the top sort of 10 leagues in europe he's probably one of the top top five or ten young young players in that regard uh and I, yeah i think he's that good and um you know he's the sort of player that you know a team like an Atalanta or a Leipzig or a Brighton would be very, very aware of in terms of mm -hmm. his, his underlying performance data. So I, I think it's, I think he's the Jota thing. If it has a silver lining, it will be if Abada gets a, a run in the team. You know, he set up Kyogo's goal at the weekend. Um, you know, if he gets a long run at it, even last season when he he rarely started, and he was coming on for bits of minutes here and there, all of it, virtually all of his performance numbers went up on the season before when he was more of a regular. Now, some mm -hmm. of that is you have to contextualise properly and say, coming on as a sub late in the game, there's almost some cheap cheap stats to be had by coming on late for Celtic in games where you're two, three, four goals up uh, and you can do a bit of what I call stat padding. You know, there's, there's some fun to be had. A lot of the players that were coming on, so that your Turnbulls, Giacomacchus, Abada especially, all benefited 
uh, Aksabanovich as well, all had great numbers, mainly because you know, as a sub, they weren't starting. So you've got to take that into context. But, you know, even even allowing for that, as bad as, as I say, perform, performance numbers are, are ter terrific. And, and as I say, I think it will be great if he gets a, a run in the team. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to that, actually. Uh, Michael, 89, be happy of our centre-backs were Kata Vickers, Navroski, Lagerbilk and Welsh. Uh, so I've got to say, Michael, I think Welsh will be on his way. He needs to look out for himself. Murray played once or twice, then had another operation. We're hearing as well. And Andrew Galea, Navroski has done nothing yet. The Lager boy is unproven. Is that his nickname? Let's hold our judgment. Yeah, you're absolutely right, but we can only comment on what we've seen. So after... 90 minutes or 60 minutes of football we'll comment on that what was your thoughts going back to uh, the previous comment what was your thoughts on Marvin Compier after 60 minutes against Morton probably the same uh, as everybody else Johnny Boy Soul Jim no we can't play Kobayashi at Rugby Park it's asking for trouble against a much improved Kelly team well we will see if that is the case now what's your thoughts about Hatati? does he get back in the side against Aberdeen let us know in the comments Bernabe as he slept his way into a Celtic departure Leela Bada is going to be the player of the year according to Brian Degnan or was it uh, Lloyd Patrick Jepson or both of you um, do you agree with that let us know in the comments and finally the centre halves who stays who goes let us know in the comment section 1100 strong this Friday afternoon we are buzzing for Sunday up at Pataudry hopefully it will be another league victory thank you everybody for getting involved and thanks for the five or six team we've got Lloyd Brian Jim and Alan thank you for joining me on a Celtic state of mind